Hey, I'm Tony Moreland, and this is the Samsung Developers Podcast, where we chat with innovators using Samsung technologies, award-winning app developers and designers, as well as insiders working on the latest Samsung tools. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 3. On today's show, I'm joined by the founders of Biodome Games, Tobias Thorson and Peter Holm. Not only do we chat about their award-winning mobile game, Gold Digger, but how being acquired by a larger game publisher has allowed them to focus more on game development while the publisher handles the marketing aspect of producing games. Oh yeah, and we also chat about how their game studio is now called Studio Spelunka. Enjoy. Hey, I am excited for uh, today's podcast to be interviewing not just one, but the two founders of Biodome Games, Tobias Thorson and Peter Holm. Hey guys, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. So let me first start by asking, who is Tobias Thorsen? Well, I'm um, 40 years old. I grew up in uh, rural Denmark, far out west. Uh, I would describe myself as a programmer with somewhat of an artistic sense. I like uh, programming, not because I'm particularly good at writing beautiful code, but because it gives a degree of control and you get a final say in the product you're developing. And I really like that. That's great. And now we also are joined by, by Peter Holm. Tell me, who is Peter Holm? <laughs> well, um, I'm a, a self-taught game design, usability, user experience, business, creative direction type of guy. Yeah, I enjoy making games. Wonderful. So, Tobias, so let me go back to you. What is your role at, at Biodome Games? I'm the lead programmer and a gameplay inventor, and, uh, and then I'm a co-founder. Wonderful. And, and Peter, yourself, what, what, is, what exactly is your, your role? Uh, aware of many hats. Um, I'm, I'm the CEO, formerly. Uh, I'm a game design uh, producer, artist uh, type of role. So let's talk about the history of Biodome, because I know that you guys were acquired by, by FRVR and, and actually recently changed your studio name to Spelunka. But I understand that your history goes way back, that you guys were actually friends in, in kindergarten. So, so give me that full history of, of the two of you, how you guys started working together um, and how that led up to Biodome Games and eventually now Spelunka Studio. Well, it all started around the Lego bricks in the kindergarten. I guess. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, it's true, somewhat. <laughs> yeah, somewhat true, at least. A professional uh, working together bit started at an animation studio in Copenhagen where we did 3D animation. And uh, in our spa spare time, we, we started making a game. And that spare time project kind of got out of hand and, and turned into a game that we actually released. And that was 24 years ago or something? Yeah, we released it in 2000. No, 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 we didn't. The first one was in 98. It was really? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it's so long ago. The internet was just, you know, starting out. What was the, the process for releasing those, those games? Yeah, well, the game was a kind of a, an experiment. It was called Chase Ace. And I was just getting into game development while working at the, the animation studio where Peter also worked. I kind of pivoted back to programming, which I did a lot of when I was a teenager. So I tried uh, experimented with programming a small game, which was at first only meant for our own enjoyment. I wanted a top-down shooter that I could play in split screen with my friends. Yeah. So I made that and it was quite fun and it... Uh, it just turned more and more advanced and like when you're young and you do a project like this it just takes it on its own life and you develop and develop and develop and then at some point we figured hey this is a product we are having so much fun playing it every weekend we played it and uh, so we figured uh, other people could enjoy this and so we decided to do it ourselves and back then it meant um, making our own cds and sending them by mail <laughs> So there was uh, quite a task, but there was really that was how game distribution was done back then. Wow! And, and what was the platform that you guys built it on? That was uh, Windows, and uh, to my great re regret, I programmed everything in Visual Basic because that was the language I knew back then. Yeah. And Visual Basic was definitely not made for game development, so I had to do all sorts of tricks to to make it work, and um, it just got more and more advanced. 
and and then at at some point we we figured now it's enough and we made the CDs we made 1000 CDs and uh, sold them one at a time from our website ah oh, um i know my my brief experience with gaming back in the the late 90s was um using flash and i understand that you guys have some experience also uh using flash back in those those glorious days of the of the late 90s yeah well after after our game chases we sold like 200 copies and we kind of realized we couldn't make a living from that so, uh, so we had to <laughs> get a real job so we started doing uh, advertisement games and uh, other flash games and that, that was really the platform for for gaming back then on the web was flash yeah and it, it kind of happened by accident that that what we did back then turned into into becoming an actual game company because I think at that point, from my on my perspective at least, it, making games was was kind of a, a side gig, a hobby hobby thing. But sure. what I was was desperately into was was actually Flash and getting 3D animation onto the web using Flash magic. That was kind of the big thing back then. Yeah, and the, the fancy UI designs and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, fancy <laughs> UI designs and wow transitions and whoa whatnot. A common colleague and and, and I formed a, a company focusing on on just that and and we kind of figured out along the way that hey wait a minute maybe we could just do some flash games and it seems like people want to buy those and so on. All of a sudden we had a gaming company uh, with a ton of clients all over the world and that was fun. And what was the name of that that gaming company? That was Titanic, like Titanic, but with cartoon instead. So. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a doomed name. <laughs> yeah, it was doomed. And the success, yeah, the success of that, did that go down? It it went down eventually, yes. <laughs> but I would say that we left it, Tobias and I, we left the company in 2007. A year after that, it went down. Uh, so uh, nothing on us. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> it was a series of unfortunate events that led to sure. to the company crashing. So I understand that you guys built a company, Cape Copenhagen, correct? That actually like flourished. You had you know lots of employees, over thirty employees. Um, you learned a lot of lessons from that company and some of the challenges that, that came out of that. Tell me, tell me a little bit about Cape Copenhagen. Yeah, so Cape Copenhagen came out of uh, out of Chase Ace, the first game we made way back, and Titanic. So actually, we left that company in order to to make a new version of Chase Ace. That was the big dream. We established the company that in turn turned into Cape Copenhagen. That company was focused on Chase Ace to begin with, and we worked on a demo for a long time, and we pitched it to publishers and. We didn't seem to be landing the right deal at any point, so uh, we we left it and and returned to Flash games. I fell into the trap that many game developers do, uh, programmers particularly, that uh, I want to make my own engine. Sure, that was possible back in the '90s and beginning of the 2000s, but at that point, 2008, it was the scene was so um, diverse with the graphics cards and sound cards and hardware. Uh, all over the place and multi-platform so it really was a, a too big of a task again i made a lot of programming that turned out to be dead code because um, you can't maintain such a big code base for so many cases and get out into all the corners with your own tech at least not the uh, one guy yeah we we painted ourselves into into a corner with that project and uh sure yeah and, yeah <laughs> multiple times <laughs> yeah <laughs> so learning from that we uh, we returned to the stuff that worked in uh, in in titanic and and returned to making uh, flash games for for clients and then at some point later on we uh, we finally made the jump to to unity and 3d games and, and was that the beginning of, of biodome games no the beginning of biodome games is later so cape copenhagen almost existed for 10 years wow and i think we were almost 40 people at at the peak and at some point we uh we had a lot of stuff lined up but uh, it all fell through and having a, a business that rely on client work and all the client work disappearing that's that's not really healthy sure 
And we hadn't really managed to uh, build a really solid foundation because I think we wanted too much on the same time. We really wanted to do great client work, but we also wanted to make our own games, which is by definition underfunded. Yeah. So that was a very difficult balance to strike. For, for 10 years, we kind of swapped between the two and we couldn't make a clear path. We, we didn't really want to focus entirely on client projects uh, and, and we didn't want to take too much funding and get uh, economically dependent by taking big investments and not having our own company. Yeah, sure. So, so we were kind of uh, flip-flopping around for 10 years until we could no longer flip-flop. Yeah. So we were, we were stubborn and, and flip-flopping and refusing to take other people's money and so on. So it was, it was kind of, yeah, maybe not that smart of a choice, but anyway, it was fun. Sure. It was, it was a great company. I really loved the, the, my colleagues. Amazing company. So it sounds like then um, eventually there came a moment where you decided that it was best that you just close the company, correct? Yeah, it, at a at a at some point, it was basically out of our hands. Uh, we uh, we had within the same week, we had three almost signed deals that uh, disappeared, and that was really enough to to take us out of business. So we had to close down, and that was the beginning of buy our own games. <laughs> so then, so so then, you and Tobias decide to still continue working together you, you obviously are determined to to find success we, we actually had a conversation at some point where we were looking at each other in this meeting room and things were just collapsing around us and we were kind of okay so what are we going to do get a job <laughs> i don't know how to have a get a job <laughs> we basically we were unemployable at that point i guess so we didn't have a choice <laughs> So that was it. It was just you looked at each other and said, well, you've got me and I've got you. So let's figure out something. <laughs> something like that. Something like that. Yeah. So with, with, the, with the closing of Cape Copenhagen, was that the, the beginning of Biodome Games? At Cape Copenhagen, we, uh, we had a third partner, uh, who uh, uh, Brian, who, who we worked with for, for many years. Uh, he had left the company, I think, uh, one and a half years before we uh, went belly up. Basically, he had to he had to do something else with his, his life at that point. He was he was kind of burned out on, on client work and stuff like that. Sure. But around the time that we went belly up and we had the infamous conversation in, in, in the meeting room about uh, having no choice but to start a new company, he had probably around that time joined, uh, joined a little startup called FRVR. And we kind of followed along and and looked at what they were doing while we were doing other stuff because we still wanted to do our own games. We had a client project that could get Biodome games uh, running so we didn't have to take any funding and stuff. And uh, that was basically our plan just to chug along, do a project here and there and then fund uh, another game that we wanted to do. Yeah, and I remember Brian lived in, uh, in Malta at the point and he was back in Copenhagen And he was really, really trying to sell this idea that we should work for FRVR very hard. And we were uh, skeptical. What's, what's this? And it's hyper casual. And uh, is that really our gig? Instant games. What is this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it it felt like a return to something that we left many years ago in Titanic and Flash games. Sure. So so we were we were not really convinced in the beginning and we had some other projects some very artsy projects lined up for ourselves and I remember we we made this calculation at some point if we're going to succeed with our own game and uh, distributing it and uh, making a steam version of that game and uh, becoming a hit it was it was really unlikely and and the numbers just told us well we we would just have so much better chance of succeeding if we go with Brian. And this is because, I mean, it was really was just the two of you still. I mean, it's not like you had employees. It was the two of us. Yeah. 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 yeah and, and we really tried to stick to uh, gut feeling about making our own game and realizing our artistic ambition through that game. But as, at the same time, we really wanted to, to achieve that commercial success. And I think the message that, that Brian came with 
why don't you shove your artistic ambition and, and allow yourself just to <laughs> be commercial for once? Sure. And I think, as you said to me, is that it would be a marathon to maybe get that other game finished and maybe get it shipped and so on. But because the scope was smaller and the, the tech was more accessible and, and they had good channel relationships and could get our game out there, I mean, that would just make a lot of sense. And it, it played to all our strengths and so on. It, it turned out to be a, a no-brainer because uh, what we lacked, they had. Uh, we didn't have any uh, connections in the industry to publishers and we didn't know how to put a game on on Facebook Instant or Steam. and Let alone Samsung Galaxy Store. Yeah. I mean, what? <laughs> So so we kind of saw, well, maybe we don't have to sacrifice our artistic integrity just because it's an instant game or just because it's a, a small casual game. We would still make something that, that would be ours and and feels like something we want to work on. So Sure. So then you decide to um, work closer with FRVR. They acquired Biodome Games. No, not, not at this point. Okay. Actually, we decided to to enter a publishing agreement with them. So we basically made a, uh, an exclusivity deal with them. Uh, we got to use their tech, and in return, they promised to try to publish our games if, if we made something good, of course. Sure. And and that was just a huge relief to to take that step and start making small games. And then, yeah. Fast forward two years and, and four games, and they acquired us uh, because we had proven that, that we had something that actually worked. And, and just so I have a good understanding, FRVR is basically handling like the, the, the publishing and the marketing, but, but you guys are still pretty much a, a standalone team, your own, your own studio, correct? Yeah, the new setup is, uh, is, is a, a, a 100% FRVR-owned studio, but we have full autonomy. We can do what we want, basically, as long as we try to make long-term business sense, of course. In our industry, it's a first-party studio, meaning that the publisher owns the studio. And we, we keep working on our, on, on our games, on, on the games from Biodome Games that were transferred to, to this new entity. It feels like our studio, and, and we treat it like our studio. Now, now, recently, you decided to change the name from Biodome Games to Spelunka, correct? Yeah, that was that was part of the uh, of the uh, setting up a new studio. So Biodome Games still formally exists. Now it's basically a holding company. Okay. But uh, but yeah. So so the new studio is uh, is called FRVR Studio Spelunka. And and what is the what is the meaning? What is the the thought behind Spelunka? Spelunka means cave in Latin. Uh, and if you go spelunking, you uh, explore caves. Oh, it's quite suiting for for gold digger. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's very appropriate. Um, I myself actually have spent a very little time, but did, did one day of, of spelunking. Definitely was during my uh, my my youth when uh, I didn't have a fear of small spaces and claustrophobia. I can't imagine getting back down into the earth like I did when I was younger and, and climbing around those those caves. It is exhilarating i wouldn't last a second in, in, in that environment <laughs> it would be so horrible <laughs> oh. it's a good thing we can do it in a game then yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. wonderful <laughs> <laughs> so tell me now about spelunka um how many employees are you guys four so us and, and two other guys uh and we're, we're still looking to hire more people with kind of still kind of figuring out what what kind of people we need but sure. uh, but more more developers needed yes yeah we are three programmers now and then peter so um we, we're gonna need some more uh, assistance with uh, graphics and game design and these parts wonderful well i know a lot of people who listen to the podcast are always looking for opportunities for for work so i'll make sure to include links in the in the show notes are there any links that, that we'll be able to share related to um, maybe applying for, for a job at Spelunka Studios? Yeah, I think we have one opening now on the, on the FRVR career site, but uh, I think we'll, we'll add some more in the near future. 
So let's now talk about the relationship with Samsung. How did that actually come about? Again, we have to point to to FRVI. They seem to be really amazing with the channel relationships. And that's, a, I mean, that's a huge win for us because we can really focus on on game development. That that relationship with with Samsung that uh, FOB has been been able to to build on in part on a happy half is is something that we're really grateful about. Yeah, I think uh, at at first our games was uh, mostly published on Facebook, and then when when they were kind of proven that they they worked and they generated revenue. They expanded to to the newly formed channel on Bixby, I think, back then. It's a couple of years ago. So I wasn't familiar with that. So Bixby, our, our, our voice assistant, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, I think they're still on, on older devices uh, that hadn't received updates. You would still be able to swipe right, and then you would open a discovery surface uh, called Bixby as well, where the games would be featured. And... Um, that was the first appearance on uh, on Samsung devices, uh, to my knowledge. Uh-huh. So, so yeah, it seems to be a lot of uh, Samsung channels that that uh, that the game is uh, featured on. So last year, you guys were the winner for the 2021 Best of Galaxy Store Award Best Instant Play Game. Tell me, tell me, what did it mean to to win that award? That was pretty special, I'd say. We we had not seen that coming. I mean, we we hadn't imagined in a million years that we made an award-winning game. I mean, we knew we made a great game and a fun game, but but we hadn't seen it as a as a game that would win an award. So we were super happy about it. But in in retrospect, I can see that uh, the game stands out a bit. It's a combination of gameplay and uh, and and a style that's that I haven't seen many places. So, so let's talk about Gold Digger. I mean, I, I, I played it because I was part of the, the team that was going through all of the, the nominations and selecting who was going to be a winner. I, it was a, a very addicting game to, uh, to play, but tell the folks out there what actually is Gold Digger. I, I remember when we, uh, when we came up with the idea because we were i think we were talking about a, a digging game yeah you 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 mentioned you mentioned boulder dash as i remember it you you look over your screen and say you remember boulder dash oh, i love that game i said yeah oh yeah yeah that was that was a great game maybe we should do something like that you said and i said oh yeah and we can add match three elements so you match the gems and uh, I think that was the conclusion of our game design and brainstorming session, as I remember it. <laughs> yeah, it, it was very, very brief, and which, which is, uh, I guess, a good thing that you could describe a full gameplay with the uh, one minute of talk. Mm-hmm. Hey, let's try that. That could work. And I think it, it was only a couple of days later you had the first prototype running, as I remember it at least. And then, of course, a few months until we had. Uh, playable in in the FRVR Bible when they recommend gameplay ideas to pursue. One of the key points is uh, mashups of of different genres. Ah, so so not don't make a clone, but try to to mix and match different areas and uh, see what that leads to. So so the gameplay there's this little there's like this old man miner who's going around smashing rocks looking for gems correct actually when you play it it's kind of a fast-paced mining game which is kind of odd maybe maybe because mining is is in real life it would be really slow paced <laughs> <very right>? slow. <laughs> so, but i i guess that was the inspiration we took from from boulder dash so that we we wanted it to be a, a bit more speedy and like an explorer so it, i think it's as much an exploration game as it's a, a mining game and digging game but yeah you you push rocks around and and match them up and when you align three or more rocks they explode and and help you excavate an area and then there's a lot of stuff to to discover and pick up and buy and sell so i remember seeing at the time when you won the award uh you guys produced a a meme a, a great photo graphic of your first dollar that you earned on gold digger uh, side by side with winning the samsung award um, tell me about that yeah it was quite a revelation for us to to allow ourselves to be focusing totally on on making
making something that made money. So so making our actual first dollar was quite an event. So so we made ourselves an award to to celebrate the moment, and and we awarded it to us. <laughs> so 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 thank you us for for the award. <laughs> uh, so. So yeah, that was that was how it started making our own awards and and how it's going winning actual awards from Samsung. That was uh, that was quite a day. And in many ways, Gold Digger has become the game that we dreamed of making for many many years. Uh, all the time in in Cape, we were talking about uh, oh, it would be so great to have just a small game that would make a little bit of money to support one guy who could work on this. And um, yeah. it 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 took the end of Cape Copenhagen and the rise of a new company before it actually happened for us. In a way, you could say we've been working on this game for for twenty two years. <laughs> <laughs> So, so I understand that Gold Digger is not the only gold game in your in your franchise. That you have another game called Gold Train FRVR. Tell me, tell me about Gold Train. Yeah, that was the first we made. It was a, it's a more traditional proven gameplay in many ways. It's a, based on a Pipe Mania, also a very old game where you uh, match train tracks to make the train run. Okay, and since we kind of knew what kind of game we were doing we we chose that game for just getting to the, know the tech from frvr so it was kind of a, a training game training train game <laughs> <laughs> that's great at that point we we had decided of course that we we wanted to make a game that would make us money so in order to to cast the right spell over the game we named it something with gold uh, and it it seemed to work okay so to tell me, what is the platform that you're building your games on? HTML5 and uh, built on the engine that FRVR has provided. Uh, it's all JavaScript, uh, very old style JavaScript, so no modern shenanigans. It's um, JavaScript as it looked 10, 15 years ago. So it's in many ways, it's uh, it's it's very easy and very simple to get started with, but when a project gets really complex, it's it has its own challenges as well. Yeah, I would think there would be a lot of limitations with it, but but you guys have found a way to work within those limitations to create something that's that's successful. Yeah, I'd, I'd say some of the bigger challenges has come now that we've hired new programmers who has to uh, take this uh, two-year-old code base that I've been working on exclusively and try to figure out what's going on. Our first employee, he was really... For a month, he was uh, so confused. So, so we decided to make a major cleanup of the code. We've been working on that for a couple of months now. How funny! I, I can take that as like you know, you, you take this really top level auto mechanic, and then you you throw an old an old Ferrari at him and say, "All right, yeah, <laughs> get this going here." <laughs> yeah. But about the limitations, I think part of the the charm of uh, of working with this is is actually the uh, the limitations that you have to impose on yourself and and your ambition, and and that's I think part of the reason that we can make it work. It's interesting because um, you know my my background truly is in graphic design, and and I often teach the opposite of that in the sense that you know when you're creating a logo, you don't want to limit yourself by diving right into a program like Adobe Illustrator to start designing your logo that, that really you should grab pencil and paper and start sketching so that you don't have any limitations. Hmm. But it sounds like, you know, your approach having to work within in this JavaScript, you've got some limitations. But I would think that, you know, that, that must trigger certain parts of your brain where you really have to think, like, how are you going to get this done? Yeah, I think I think what you say about logo design is, is totally true. I would definitely go for a pencil first. But again, that's the pencil is a conceptual limitation that you put into the process at that point. True. So I, I totally agree with that one. But in this case, I think uh, one of one of the great benefits about the the limitations we have with the platform is that there's a lot of stuff we just can't do, period. So we don't have to get distracted by ambient occlusion or uh, real time shadows or HDR lighting or stuff like that that's completely irrelevant to the gameplay. But if we had every single tool, we could so easily get distracted by stuff that's not super essential to to get right. 
Yeah, but essentially it's, it's a sprite engine. You can display sprites and you can display a lot of them, but that's it. There's no uh, spinning stuff and no uh, 3D. <laughs> yeah. uh, hard, hardly any animation system. We had to make that ourselves also. So. Oh, wow. So I would think that the process, I mean, tell me, is it, would you say it's quicker? I mean, I know that some of these game developers that I've, that I've chatted with, it takes them years to, to go to market uh, on a design that they're working on. Do you think those limitations actually help speed up the process? Because you can't go down all these different avenues and, and work on things such as 3D and, and, and lighting. Yeah, definitely. In, in the beginning, it's, uh, it's very, very fast to make a prototype and uh, try something out. And I think the challenge really comes when you're when you're continuously working on a project and it gets more and more complex because then JavaScript really has its limitations. Sure. Yeah, and I, I think the platform says a lot about your genre choice as well. You wouldn't you wouldn't go ahead and make a, a first person shooter, and that wouldn't make sense. I mean, you would yeah. you would pick another tool for it. From the first prototype until Gold Digger went live, I think that was about three or four months or something like that. Wow, that, that is so quick. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a great joy to work with with that quick turnaround because you get something done, right? Yeah, and you get the feedback so quickly yeah, yeah. too because as soon as you put it out there, you start... I mean, you had mentioned that you had first released like on, on, on Facebook Instant. I mean, you're almost using that as your testing platform. So you release it quickly like this, you get that yeah. feedback, and now you can get back into the studio and start finding ways to really improve on it before it gets out to the to the larger audience. Exactly, exactly. And you have actual people playing it and, and having opinions about it and uh, telling you what what they think about it. Uh, that's that's just so much more fun than, than sitting deep in the trench working sure. on the same project for two or three years without it seeing any type of reality. And, uh, and a lot less risky. Yeah, of course. It saves a lot of money too, I would say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So I'd like to talk a bit about the, the marketing. I know that FRVR is, is handling all of this for you. What were some of the, the tools that, that worked? Because I've seen some banners that, that you guys have done on Galaxy Store. Yeah, for us at least, privileged situation that, that FRVR handles uh, most of that. And, and we, we basically just supply them with, uh, with assets that they can, they can build uh, banners and stuff from. And I have some of these banners were related to different seasons, whether it's Halloween or, or Valentine's, correct? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so what we, what we did recently was uh, was uh, some seasonal updates for, for the game. Uh, we had a, uh, a super nice uh, Christmas update for it with uh, a snowy landscape and uh, oh. uh, and you could explore the mine and, and find the... Uh, Christmassy uh, decorations and, and stuff, and I think you could even get a Santa hat. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I think we we had a very nice feature from uh, from Samsung on, on 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 that. And of course, that's uh, so nice to see that they uh, they would yeah spend some some nice storefront for the game. Sure. So tell me, are there other games that you guys have uh, produced outside of Gold Digger and Gold Train? Yeah. We have uh, we have two other games. We have uh, Pot Rush and uh, Pool Rush, mini golfing game and a, a pool game. It's it's a very casual approach to a pool and a very casual approach to mini golf. It's a uh, sure something that a, a hardcore pool player would would uh, find appalling because you just <laughs> you just sit there and you shoot balls, hit the balls and get them in the, into the hole. It's very simple. And it's uh, not even on a pool table. It's on an endless, uh, <laughs> an endless track. I'll have to check that out. Tell me, so where are you guys getting your your ideas for games? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> <There's> no... <laughs> I mean, sometimes it's just like what we talked about with Gold Digger, just two reference points and then yeah. a weird connection. Other times, it's it's more like what type of interaction would be fun. What would feel good? Okay. And then in turn, how could we turn that into a game? I think the 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 pool rush and pot rush games uh, kind of grew out of that approach, 
we we kind of wanted a very simple interaction that would be fun and and quick to repeat. I think we had a few iterations of, of that before it, it kind of gelled into into a, a pool game and a, and a, a mini golf game. And it was uh, very much inspired also by one of FRVR's biggest hits, which is a basketball game, where the only thing you do is you flip basketballs. Oh, okay. And have to hit the hoop so the the gameplay style is quite similar you just shoot balls again and again and again and you can get really good at it and you can suck at it <laughs> i remember there was a game a long time ago very similar where you were just throwing trash into a, a little trash bin yes yeah. yeah and i think that's that for me at least that's been uh, that's been kind of a fascination all the way back from the first flash games that how how much can you boil down the experience how how small can you make it and still make it enjoyable i still think that's that's very much a, a motivation of, for me at least to or a driver for me at least to to see how how tiny can you make it how much of a great experience can you make it with the smallest mechanic possible basically so tell me what is your your process for designing developing in and then publishing a game FRVR has a, a, a set of goalposts you have to reach. First, you make a prototype that uh, the guys there review, they're game designers, and they look at the game and try to give their input on whether or not it would succeed or if it has potential. Then if, if they approve it and think uh, we might be able to do something with that, we make a prototype, and it's then put out on a very limited market. So there's a, a, a small subset of players who get to play it. And then uh, during this process, uh, the retention is measured and you see how many people are actually returning to it. And, and these are paid users. They are advertising sure. and uh, people come and play. And then there are uh, a set amount of iterations where you try to improve in each iteration to see if you can get the game sticky enough. And this process is uh, in large part to avoid working a lot on a game that's doesn't have potential that's not going to work in the real world. So if you pass through these uh, goalposts, you it's published to a wider audience worldwide. Okay. And I think and I think if if we should just talk a bit about our internal process as well, it 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 would be more something al along the lines of, of running with a, a gut feel up until the point where we felt we had something that would show some kind of potential. And then trying to find the smallest subset of that that we could take to a level where it could actually be tested in in, in live circumstances. So we've seen a lot of success around Gold Digger. Can you tell me like how many active users do you guys have uh, playing the game? Um, across uh, Samsung channels, I think we're seeing about. Of course, it it goes up and down with with. Sure. Uh, store features and stuff, but an average about a hundred thousand active uses a day. Wow! So that's that's pretty neat. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Two guys just creating a game like that, and, and you've got over a hundred thousand people playing it daily. Yeah, it it felt really weird in the beginning when when it started to take off. And uh, I remember at the start we were extremely popular in Vietnam huh. and Poland. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. There, there was some some strange demographic that we we never fully discovered why. But uh, yeah. Yeah. It's sometimes like that, you suddenly get a spike in in a in a market that you didn't expect at all. So obviously, revenue needs to play a part somewhere when it comes to the success of a game. So tell me, what is it that you guys are doing to help generate revenue? Uh, while playing Gold Digger? Well, the the, the very mm, basic uh, stuff is, uh, is, of course, that the main revenue is, uh, is is coming in from ads. We try to find convenient or you could say, quote unquote, natural places to, to show ads. And uh, hopefully some players would click those ads. And when they do that, that generates some revenue back to us. Also on uh, on platforms that support it, we, we have uh, in-game purchases. So you could actually pay real money to buy stuff. So what are your what are your key learnings when it comes to, to IAP? The key learning, I think, is, is that people actually want to pay for stuff uh, when they enjoy the game. So if you make a great game, people will definitely pay for stuff in the game. I remember in the beginning when these uh, in-app purchase issues came up with uh, there was some uh, Smurf game where people bought Smurf berries and uh, 
I was very skeptical. I said, but who's paying for this? <laughs> but again, it's a, if you make something that's actually fun and people want to play, then they'll pay. Yeah, I, I was listening to a podcast once, different, different market, but they were talking about IEP uh, in a sense that you know they could have hundreds of thousands of people interacting with this, but all it takes is a small percentage that are willing to pay, and that truthfully can generate a, a decent amount of revenue. That because the the reach is so big, I mean, it's a global audience that it just takes a few people, you know, interested in in actually paying. The they can really help bring some some money your way. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, it is it is a, a, a game of volume uh, because you you need a lot of ads to be shown, and you you need a lot of players to to have enough players that would actually want to spend real money on it as well. So. So one of the, the things that really stood out for me when I was playing Gold Digger was the music. So let's talk a bit about the, the music of, of Gold Digger. We're fortunate to work with a really great composer that is also happens to be a, a friend of, and former colleague. His name is uh, Rasmus Hartvi, and uh, if uh, anyone is out there listening and, and wants some music, you should definitely hire him because he's, he's so great. Actually, we work with him in in our past company, and uh, and he's uh, he's working with the FIB as well now. Yeah. So the song that we just heard leading up to this question that was from uh, Gold Digger, and a few of the other songs, um, the one that we started the podcast off with, and, and one that we'll be closing with, those were from uh, Gold Train. So yeah, absolutely beautiful music that you guys are uh, creating there at FRVR. And it's it's actually something that people comment on. We we get a lot of feedback where people say. Hey, what's that music? Actually, there's a funny story about that composer. Back in the day, we, we made a game for, for Lego, and it was uh, for a, a Disney-themed uh, IP, and uh, we needed some music for that game. And our composer was uh, Rasmus, who, who made the, the music for, for these games as well. He made some, uh, some Disney-inspired music that was completely original. He made it all from scratch. And um, once Disney had to approve the game, they were kind of going okay where's that music from what movie did you grab that from <laughs> really oh it's it's totally original music don't worry it's <laughs> so they were they were kind of impressed with them so wow so he does music for not just you guys but for many of the other franchises underneath uh frvr correct yeah yeah he's uh i think he's the closest thing they get to a to a house composer so what advice would you give developers looking to uh, bring their games to Galaxy Store? Work with a great publisher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the advice we took was uh, was uh, work with FRVR. That's great. And I love hearing about that because I know a lot of indie developers, their challenge is they've come up with a great game, but these are not marketing people. These are not publishing people. I mean, these really are great game designers. And then where do they go? How do they take their game out to the public. So it, it's wonderful to hear that there is a, a resource with a company like FRVR that these indie developers can turn to um, that can actually bring their game to, to market. Yeah, and it, it's hard work doing publishing and it's hard work to maintain the relations with uh, with different uh, outlets like the Galaxy Store. It's, it's, it's not something that you just walk in from the street and say, hey, can you put our game on the store and feature it? I think a lot of game developers forget about it. I, I did for many years. I, I thought uh, if you just make a great game, then it'll all come by itself. That's not true. <laughs> Selling is hard, right? It's not something you want to do next to your making the game job. You you want dedicated people to take care of that. Yeah, and I would think that really game developers, they've got that their brain is wired for being creative and, and wanting to code or you know figure out the technology behind it the last thing i want to do is like get on a phone and try and start doing the marketing yeah making those phone calls to try and you know get their game out there to be seen yeah exactly it's it's liberating to to hand it off to someone who knows what they're doing <laughs> so what is in the future for spelunka well the the near future is uh, way more gold digger and i think we 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 have a lot of fun ideas for for making the game even more fun for our players and uh, yeah and we're just looking forward to dive deeper into it 
And I know you guys are a, a small company. You, you just are a few people. What are in your future plans uh, related to diversity and inclusion? Well, right now, we, we have to be totally honest. We're just four white dudes, all the same age and all <laughs> <laughs> sporting the same beer gut and stuff like that. So it's it's kind of... I mean, it's it's not really diverse, but uh, but we really want to change that up. We uh, strongly believe that diverse teams make better decisions and and better games. Sure. And we're super happy to to first experience when the game came out that that it, it's a very even fifty fifty split male female. Really? Okay. Yeah, and it's a rare thing to to get something like that. Yeah. So uh, so we we really want to emphasize that, and um, I think the the Age-wise, the, the audience is extremely wide as well. We have young kids playing it, and we recently had a very nice letter from a, a 70-something-year-old gentleman who, who enjoyed playing it with his wife. Wow. So, I mean, it's it's a, it's a very, very wide audience, and we want to cater to that. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is very unique. Now, and, and the game is very new. I mean, it is a, it is a young game. Do you have plans of maybe like offering the ability to to skin your character to be able to create something that maybe somebody relates to a little bit more? Yeah, I, I don't think everyone wants to be that red bearded, grumpy old miner. So <laughs> <laughs> I think it would only be fair to enable people to make their own characters and so on. That's that's part of it of, of the scope as well at some point. Sure, definitely. So, Tobias, tell me, what is it that you do for fun outside of, of work? I understand that you actually are a pretty artsy person. Well, when you sit all day and program and stare into a screen, it's quite nice to do something physical. So uh, I've been doing lots of stuff over the years with uh, painting and arts. And uh, lately I've been doing a lot of ceramics. So it's a quite new hobby for me. Ceramics, really? So pottery? Yeah, pottery and uh, modeling and doing crazy sculptures. I, I've never thought much about th these things uh, until I really tried it. And when I when I held an item that I made, which was all glossy and looked totally finished, yeah, it was uh, quite of a, a, a nice experience. So I dove more into it. It's um, very rewarding to have. Uh, to eat out of a plate that you made yourself. <laughs> oh, that's, that, that's wonderful. So, and, and, and Peter, um, let me ask you, what is it that you do for fun outside of work? I, I understand that you actually like to pretend to be a, a lumberjack. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> I have a big, <laughs> um, big um, badly maintained garden and, uh, and a small strip of forest that, that I can joyfully call my own. And, and once in a while, we have a storm that, that topples a tree and, and I get to, to cut it up and chop it for firewood and, and stuff like that. So I, I really enjoy, you could say, rough gardening like that. <laughs> also woodworking and artsy, artsy do-it-yourself projects with uh, all the kids, which, of which I have four. Wow, that's excellent. <laughs> yeah. So I have one more question for you. Since you guys became friends, you said back when uh, you started kindergarten. Tell me, who is better at sharing, Tobias or Peter? Sharing? <laughs> what do you mean sharing? Yes. <laughs> That's definitely Tobias. Uh, Tobias is, is a very, very generous soul that, that shares all his good ideas. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Hey, guys, it has been absolutely wonderful to, to chat with the two of you. Um, you guys are doing great work at, at Spelunka, and I'm looking forward to seeing much more down the road on, on Galaxy Store. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was, a, it was a pleasure to talk to you. Looking to start creating for Samsung? Download the latest tools to code your next app. Or get software for designing apps without coding at all. Sell your apps to the world on the Samsung Galaxy Store. Check out developer.samsung.com today and start your journey with Samsung. The Samsung Developers Podcast is hosted by Tony Moreland and produced by Jeannie Sue. 